Gil in a gila, to chonic er shli in uignus. Crystal on crystal, a garmus grinina. Binus on vinus a frittel nor chrean gruama. Derga is finna de fiona nagrius gruinif. Hundreds of years ago, the Irish word ashling came to refer to a particular kind of visionary experience, a dream vision, or what the poet Paul Muldoon prefers to call a vision voyage. There was a formula, a certain kind of poem emerged describing a dramatic encounter in narrative form. By slippage nowadays, many people will use the word ashling to refer to the personification at the heart of this poem. For our purposes, Ashling refers to the poetic tradition of the formal Ashling, which emerged in the late 17th century. Many aspects of the form are consistent from one poem to the next, although poets, if they're going to be worth reading, usually mess around with the formula a little bit. I'll mention what some of the main conventions are. The traditional Ashling is written in the Irish language. The verse of the Ashling is very complicated, presenting a challenge to modern translators. Describing the poem which we are reading in translation as the Glamoured, Frank O'Connor writes, In Irish the poem is pure music, each line beginning with assonantal rhymes on the short vowel like mistress and bitter, which gives it the secretive whispering quality of dresses rustling or of light feet scurrying in the distance. The Ashling begins with the speaker in a state of despair. He encounters a mysterious woman. This is the spare van, literally meaning sky woman. The speaker asks who the stranger is, assuming that she is divine. He will invoke a range of names from classical myth. The woman reveals herself to be Ireland personified. She tells her unhappy tale in which the political situation is encoded as an unwanted union and sexual assault. The woman's, or Ireland's, true partner lies in Catholic lands. She awaits saviours who never seem to arrive. The speaker is sympathetic and laments the woman's situation. The vision ends with the spare van dismissing the speaker poet or leaving herself. The earliest Ashling poem we're reading is Eogán O'Rahala's Gila na Gila, translated as The Glamoured by Seamus Heaney. This poem ends, as the Ashling tradition formally should, with a reiteration of the political crisis at the heart of the vision in a new section of the poem called The Kangal, meaning The Knot. In tradition, this conclusive part of an Ashling poem adopts a new metre. Heaney marks the division from the main body of the poem on the page. By contrast, Owen Rua O'Sullivan's Magic Mist, Kyo Driechte, has an unusual optimism at the ending for an Ashling poem. Generally, these are pessimistic poems. They look to a happier past, nostalgically, but they hold little optimism of improving the current reality. As time progresses, moving into the 18th century, poetry itself becomes more of an implicit concern of the Ashling form, because it had become clear that Ireland faced not only foreign occupation, but as consequence of that, eradication of native cultural forms, including the bardic tradition. So the technical accomplishment of the Ashling form is a way of asserting the validity of an endangered bardic culture. Things seemed especially bleak at the time of Art McQuivig's Ashling poem, The Churchyard of Cregan, which alludes to decisive battles lost at the Boyne and at Ockram. Indeed, the speaker poet in this work would prefer to remain in the dream vision forever if he could, rather than having to return to the reality of Ireland. 